go ahead and uh, get started. We have quite a few people on board. I'm sure some others will be joining as we go along. Good morning, afternoon to all of you, depending on where you're currently based. We hope you're doing well and staying safe. My name is Danielle Ostrander, and I currently serve as Managing Director of the Due Diligence Team at Griffin Strategies. I joined Griffin in 2008 and currently oversee a team of approximately 30 analysts who conduct due diligence investigations in jurisdictions around the world. Our team serves a number of clients in the financial sector, including but not limited to global banks, sovereign wealth funds, fund of funds, and private equity firms. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with Griffin Services, in addition to our wide spectrum of due diligence offerings, we also have a litigation support and investigations team, as well as a data mining and analytics team. It is our pleasure to bring you this webinar today in partnership with Clarity Capital, Perform Due Diligence Services, and Shed More Advisors. We are thrilled you were able to join us and hope this webinar provides you with some valuable insight. We'll begin our webinar with a number of questions for the panelists, and at the end, we'll open the discussion to questions from all of you. Please submit your questions at any point during our discussion today using the chat feature on your screen. With that, I'd like to introduce you to the panelists we have on board with us today. First, Neil Dascal, Manager at Clarity Capital. Neil manages Clarity Capital's private alternative investments, which include private debt, real estate, and special situations private equity. Prior to joining Clarity Capital, Neil worked at Calculus Capital, a private equity business based in Johannesburg, South Africa. In that role, Neil gained valuable private equity experience, including managing the company's local and international investments across many different sectors, acquiring and selling portfolio companies, and managing the holding company's lending relationships with major banks. Neil was deployed for over a year in a financial executive capacity and performed a successful turnaround in one of the investment companies. Neil also gained experience in non-traditional private equity investment classes, such as real estate and debt. Before joining Calculus, Neil worked at Standard Bank in various roles in the investment, excuse me, bank's investment banking and wealth divisions. Neil is a qualified chartered accountant. Next, we have James Newman, co-head of Perform Due Diligence Services. James is responsible for product development and delivery at Perform, a London-based third-party due diligence service that offers asset owners ODD support. James previously spent eight years as global head of ODD at Barclays Wealth, where he developed and led operational risk assessments across the bank's retail and non-retail investment product offerings. A chartered accountant, James has over 20 years of financial services experience. And last but not least, we have Mike Merrigan, founder of Shadmore Advisors. Prior to founding Shadmore in 2014, Mike was a managing director of Gotex Fund Management, a fund of funds, and a member of Gotex's investment committee. Prior to his four years at Gotex, Mike implemented the first in-house ODD program at General Motors Asset Management, at the time one of the world's largest pension plans, with assets under management exceeding $100 billion. Mike has focused his career on alternative investments since 2002, working as an investment due diligence analyst at HRJ Capital and Credit Suisse's Hedge Fund Investments Group. Mike began his career working in the operations group of Gabelli Asset Management. Thank you to all the panelists for taking the time to join us today. My first question for all of you, what has been the biggest adjustment from a personal and professional perspective, excuse me, since the start of COVID? Neil, let's go ahead and start with you. Thanks, and thank you for having me on today. Um, I must say that I was presently surprised as to how effective it was to work from home. Uh, you can see that we back in the office here in Israel. Um, as we all know, tech systems have over the last few years developed tremendously to allow for video calls, webinars such as this, team collaborations, um, remote desktop connect connections, etc., to to happen. Um, and from a personal point of view, uh, it was obviously great to have a few more lunches with my wife. <laughs> Fair enough. And James, how about you? Thanks, Danny, and it's a pleasure to take part. Um, yeah, no, it's it's pretty good actually. Uh, it, you know, we've I suspect like many, I've you know I've found it remarkably easy to work from home. You know, I have an office set up here in my home. I've got a large screen for work. I've even got a microphone for webinars such as this. This is plenty of room, uh, ability to close the door on, of course, on what's going on in the house. Um, and actually, I've, you know, I've had more conversations with overseas people than before lockdown. So that's been a pleasure to be to be able to do that. Um, and on a personal front, my, my choice of fitness is cycling. So I've been able to fit in a couple of rides per week, which has been great. 
whereas that's, well, that was very difficult when I were before I was commuting in uh, in, into the office. In, in terms of challenges, um, I think, you know, the flexibility means you tend to work longer hours and weekends sort of blur into, into the week. Um, and then, of course, the occasional unintentional family webinar bomber, uh, hopefully uh, not today, uh, but that also obviously usually adds a bit of fun, of course. Um, and in person, of course, I look forward to face to face contact with peers and clients when we can finally do that. Great. And Mike, how about you? Danny, thanks so much to you and to Griffin uh, for allowing me to participate in the webinar today. Um, yeah, so the pandemic has, has obviously had some challenges, but I think, um, you know, uh, been able to stay healthy as well as my family. And um, we have had an opportunity to spend more time at home, less travel, which has been nice. Uh, there is a lot of travel related to ODD typically. And um, I'd say the probably biggest challenge is we have three young children and just trying to help them manage through their online learning through school, uh, right. which is about to come to an end soon. And now trying to figure out what we're going to do with them over the summer to keep them busy. So <laughs> our real challenges yeah, right now, hoping. which are uh, good challenges to have. Right. Yeah. Obviously, a lot of uncertainty about what's going to happen in the fall, too. So, <laughs> you know, yeah, good, the fall good wishes for the summer mark. and then hopefully. Yeah, right. Yeah. A lot of question marks over that. So, so James, I have a question for you now. We'll go ahead and kind of do a round robin with all of you. And, and my first question for you is, you know, all of us to some degree are doing, you know, some level or another of due diligence, um, you know, in part of our roles. Walk me through your process a little bit. You know, what technologies do you use versus what do you do a little bit more manually? Yeah, I know. Sure, happy to comment on that. Uh, I, I tend to place background checks into, uh, into two camps. Um, the first is what we as an ODD business are able to do. Uh, you know, this would include uh, current regulatory online checks, you know, permissions, form ADV, DRPs and so on, uh, corporate histories. Interesting to see mergers uh, that potentially have happened with a manager in the last couple of years. Of course, LinkedIn on individuals to, you know, to get a sense of biographies and relative experience. Uh, I was only just this morning looking at one uh, one conducting officer for a for a, an A firm that I'm looking at who only has seven months experience in doing that job. So you know you can do a few things there yourself, um, but it, it is relatively limited. And so second, in sort of second camp, I'd say was then there is a you know a deeper uh, integrity check that a a third party would conduct on behalf of a client that goes much further than a than a simple online check. And as you know, Danny. Uh, and after completing our own due diligence, we have engaged Griffin as our preferred supplier uh, for deep dive background checks. Um, and these are particularly important, I think, for new managers, uh, particularly important today, I think, given the, uh, the, uh, the difficulty in actually getting to visit and uh, managers uh, issues around on site. So getting more background information, I think, is is very is very important um, and also for ongoing monitoring purposes you know investing remains a trust relationship you need to know who you are continuing to to invest with so yeah i mean the background check is 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 a vital piece of the or one of the tools that we have in in the toolkit that we wish to use uh, both on initial and ongoing basis in, in terms of technology uh use in operational due diligence um for a long time as an allocator, I was left, frankly, quite frustrated with the inadequacies of Word and Excel and email and SharePoint, which I'm sure a lot of our listeners can can uh, can, uh, can reflect on and and, uh, and agree with. It, I mean, you know, those sorts of software or applications are they're all too manual. They're unconnected. Uh, it's a bad use of an ODD professional's time in, in my, in, in my, my uh, um, in, in impression. Um, so at Perform, we use technology as an enabler. It's not a fintech, but it's a, it enables us, um, and by that what I mean significantly, you know, reduces the collecting, organizing, and producing time of operational due diligence while significantly improving the management of documents and reports and, and even analysis. We have, for example, automated flags to uh, to capture certain answers to which we want further analysis on, and that certainly improves the um, and maintains consistency from one report uh, to another. 
thank you. You know, definitely, definitely valuable insight. And obviously, you know, we at Griffin see the value too in, in, in the background checks. You know, that's, that's the nature of our business. And, you know, I know, you know, we've, we've worked with, with all three of you guys in, in that capacity and in conducting those types of due diligence background checks. So, you know, I think you guys kind of all, all see that added value. And it's, it's something that, you know, it's, a lot of a lot of public information, but it's a lot of you know we have the the ability to put it into a concise format that's easy to read for you guys, and you guys then don't have to sort through all the you know the results and the false positives. And you know obviously our goal too here at Griffin is not just give you the results, but give you an analysis of the results too. Um, you know, I, you guys, all three of you guys are based in, in different jurisdictions around the world um, and don't necessarily have that knowledge of all those those different international. Um, components that kind of, you know, what's, what's available in the U.S. versus what's available in the U.K. versus what can you get, you know, in Israel or Russia, you know, Latin America. So, you know, we kind of have that no that knowledge and that's why, um, you know, we're glad that you people like you, your guys, all of you guys, um, you know, reach out to us and, and utilize us for that that exact reason because I think it provides you definitely some, some valuable insight. Um, you know, Mike, to, as part of the ODD process, you know, I know you guys obviously do, you do the background checks, um, but you also do, you know, the on-site checks. Right now, where you can't do the on-site checks and can't go in-house to, to these funds, you know, how much of a concern is that for you right now as you kind of go through COVID? I mean, this this is probably the biggest question within our industry, um, this lack of on-sites and how are people are adopting to it and getting comfortable with it. Um, what's interesting, with good intentions, I think after Madoff, many allocators had built into their procedures that an onsite was required as a component of their due diligence. And so once the pandemic happened and the lockdowns happened globally, um, that was no longer really possible and continues to this day and for the foreseeable future. So people have had to read their plans. When we uh, started having conversations with people in March and there was a lot less out there, the virus and how it was going to impact the you know the globe. I think people were trying to push back uh, investment, so they might have thought, well, we'll wait another month or two, and then we can see how things look then. So, and then they wouldn't have some of the in place. And I think as March and April went on, um, the people who previously were probably uncomfortable with doing some sort of virtual ODD. Uh, substitute for onsite grew significantly, and I think it will continue to grow because people have realized now that the situation we're in is quite an extended situation time-wise, and um, even one turn office, the managers themselves may be unwilling to have visitors there. So um, we'll talk later, I think, about some of the tools that we have and what we're trying to get out of the onsites. But I think um, when we kind of did informal polling. In March versus today, there's been a significant increase in the amount of people who are open to virtual on sites uh, as, as opposed to before. You know, I think one of the things that I've, I've learned as we go through all of this, and, I, and James and I may have even had the same conversation, is, is you know, I think the people that are going to do really well and come out of all this are the people are going to do something different than what they were doing before. So I think it's all going to be about you know adapting, and, and we've done it in the past, you know, with with every you know, 2001, 2008, you know, even uh, events that happened prior to all those things. So I think we've all kind of learned to adapt and overcome. I think this is just going to be another another one of those situations. Um, and so, to Neil, to you, you know, one thing I know that's changed, especially for us over the last few months, is, um, and I'm sure it has for you as well, is just like the means for overall communication and interaction with, with colleagues and clients. Um, you know, now you guys are obviously in the office, um, but for you, what have you done to kind of overcome the inability to meet people face to face and, and what new tricks, if any, do you have um, to come up with to make the interaction a little smoother um, that you anticipate is going to continue post COVID? I guess for us, there's clients and then there's our investment partners. So from a client's perspective, Clarity Capital is a boutique wealth and asset management firm, um, which means that in any case, we have quite an intimate and a relationship with our clients. We communicate with them uh, even during regular times on a very frequent um, basis. In light of the recent situation, that frequency stepped up even further. Um, at the heart of the COVID-19 financial market stress, our chief investment officer was sending out 
regular updates to all our clients to shed a bit more light on the situation and um, you know make them feel a little bit more informed from an investment point of view um, when we also stepped up the intensity of our communication with our partners in the different investment companies and investment funds that we are invested in and we did that in order to get really an intimate first-hand view of how the crisis was affecting them and each and every investment that we have in our books um, and then we took that feedback from the public and non-public markets and we communicated that to our relevant clients on, on an investment level an individual investment level as well um, we held our clients hand through this process and we it was important to remind them of the long-term nature um, of the objectives of the investment objectives um, all in all I'm sorry I'm having I was unable to catch the the very end of that it looks like we, we lost your sound there um but but no thank you and I appreciate appreciate the insight for for certain um Mike I want to ask the next question to you because I think it kind of goes in, in line a little bit with um what, what Neil was just talking about um how can managers bridge the ODD gap during the pandemic to kind of remediate the effects of not being able to do on sites and not being able to have that that face to face communication? Yeah, I think that um, the, the, there's the managers that we've been working with over the last two to three months since the on sites uh, really ended. Um, the ones that that I think have been the best situations have really been the ones that have gone above and beyond to extend the transparency. That, that probably wasn't really available uh, under these circumstances previously. Um, one of the things that I like to say is that, you know, people's expectations of in-person meetings for three or four hours or more was, was fairly common. Uh, people's expectations for three or four hour phone calls really was not very much in line with their expectations nor their desires. Um, there's been a complete reversal of so I think that w when we've had conversations with people recognizing that we couldn't come in and visit with them, they've made themselves available through conference calls and video conferences for many, many hours, in some cases multiple times, uh, to help us get through this process, which uh, is incredibly, uh, you know, a lot of gratitude from us with that respect. So that alone is a good example. Um, there are clearly many things that were only available on site uh, that could be viewed, things like compliance manuals, especially in the US. And so um, those types of documents have increasingly been shared through data rooms, uh, through screen shares, um, things like that. And um, I would just say that the transparency, making themselves more available, um, and you know, trying to come up with novel ideas to bridge the gap so that um, the substitutes that we're working with today are good substitutes as opposed to uh, inferior substitutes or insufficient substitutes because we that is what we're doing now. We're trying to find good substitutes for the on-site and what we were trying to get out of those on-sites. And right. the managers that have been the most transparent, the most uh, willing to spend the time, uh, we've found those uh, to be very, very productive conversations. And that those are the things that I would recommend to the investment managers okay. as they go through this process. Oh, no, totally, totally fair point. Now, you know, James, it's, a lot of businesses have obviously been affected by, by this, this crisis. And, you know, I think are now just trying to come out of that, that hole, so to speak. Um, and, you know, presumably a lot of firms have been facing a lot of cost pressures as part of that, you know, just cutting back on, on, on where they can. Um, and, you know, over the years, perhaps the, the threat of, of Ponzi schemes has, has gone away. From your perspective, what is the state of ODD today? I, I think it's both in a, it's in a good place right now in a lot of respects, because I, I do firmly believe that uh, we're, we're at a point with the market convulsions, uh, with liquidity issues in the market, um, with various stresses as well. But it really underscores and underlines the point for the need of, of, of good operational due diligence. Um, but that said, you know, asset owners, just like managers, have 
face these cost pressures and these ongoing cost pressures and ODD is a typically a non-revenue generating function so there's um, or it might be you know considered to be part of the sort of compliance function or indeed uh, or maybe part of the overall investment process but regardless it needs in my view to continue to demonstrate value and relevance um, and throughout my ODD career I've always sought ways to meet those requirements uh, now that I'm on the other side of the fence uh, providing ODD services you know we see our relationships with clients as more than just providing ODD reports we listen we advise uh, we work with clients to ensure that they can deliver for themselves internally best in class operational due diligence, due diligence services um, back in the day and, and by this I mean during the 20 well during the noughties you know Ponzi schemes and frauds were 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 out there you know big time um, it was a constant concern of mine whenever I was out on the road um, performing um, due diligence reviews on emerging managers that, that there could be a fraud or a Ponzi scheme even though it was a very very small percentage but nonetheless it was a genuine um, threat and all too real for me personally when I avoid, avoid, avoided the mishap of Madoff through my uh, my own team's veto but I think it's dangerous to believe the threat of Ponzi schemes have now gone yes regulatory rules are designed to prevent mismanagement improve transparency right. Um, and but you know I, I think that has led to fewer um, bad headlines. But without thorough ODD and IDD, there is still uh, still still the threat. I mean, only last year there was premium points, uh, right? Which were you know those executives were convicted for fraudulently inflating values, um, and then there was the, uh, the Dubai-based PE firm that got into tr trouble, um, losing investors millions. So I think the threat's still there, and uh, we need to remain on our guard. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely something good, good to keep an eye out for as we go through this. And you know, that's you know, certainly any sort of sign that there could be, you know, mismanagement or misuse, or somebody has kind of a, a sketchy, sketchy background or sketchy path. It's something that I feel like is not, you know, the the telltale sign, but something to definitely be mindful of. And and that's something that we like to point out too when we're doing our background checks. Is you know, it's not it's not just the data dump. You know, I was talking about the analysis earlier. You know, you have somebody that may have been the CFO of three or four different hedge funds, and, and that's not the end of the world. Um, but if you start finding that those hedge funds have all closed when they're the CFO, and you know, maybe there's not something that's directly implicating them, but you know, it's clearly you know, they're at the top of the food chain, so to speak. You know, there's what, what's going on. They must have known something was going on. Why are they closing? And you know, it could be a very valid reason, but if you find a history of that, you know, that's definitely something you're going to want to keep an eye out for because you definitely don't want history to repeat itself and you certainly don't want to end up in you know a situation like a like a ponzi scheme um you know, the, the next question i have is, is for all of you but neil i'm going to direct it to you first you know be, beyond you know you're looking at funds there's obviously a lot of different things that you're you're looking at um or not necessarily funds but you know any sort of exter external manager investment beyond before performance and uh, you know other financial accolades what qualities do you think your clients are, are looking for in an external manager so when we start looking at an external manager, first and foremost, what's most important for us is we look to see that they're good, honest people of integrity, and they're highly transparent with us in all their dealings. Uh, we see ourselves as partners with our managers, and we expect to get that reciprocal feeling of partnership from them as well. Um, we expect managers to be consistent and communicate very frequently. Um, I'll give you a bit of an insight um, into, in, into the due diligence process that, that we go through. So we try and think of it as a private equity style due diligence process. We try and keep our finger always on the pulse. Um, before we invest, um, we track the funds, we get to know them, um, and we move on to an in-depth to an in-depth due diligence once we're comfortable. Uh, we also, as you mentioned, we we do background checks, and we've used you guys as well for that. Um, once a manager passes all the, our internal processes and it goes through investment committee, we we can go ahead and invest. But then, like for a lot of companies, I know that's when the due diligence ends. For us, really, that's when it starts. We monitor all our investments on a monthly basis, at least. 
and uh, on a quarterly basis we do a due diligence review um, on an annual level we then do a similar due diligence that we did at the before we invested before we initially invested why why did i tell you all of that in order to explain and, and highlight the, that the, all of this requires a lot of interactions from from the fund and from a manager or any other investment that we make and that's why we expect to have really a direct line of communication not just with the investor relations or business development team but directly with the portfolio managers and the cfos and any other key people both on the investment and operational side of the company no no thank you and that's you know, that's you kind of brought up or touched upon something you know looking at managers regularly and, and continuing to, to review them not just doing the initial review but continue to kind of keep a pulse on them as you continue down the relationship with them and that's you know that's something that we definitely try and um, to promote to you know our clients as well is is you know you don't even if you have a long standing relationship with somebody you, you don't know what could creep up on them and it, it's not that they're you know bad people necessarily but you want to make sure that you kind of know who you're you're involved with this you know it could be as simple as they you know they have tax liens against them but if they have you know start building those up that's going to be a concern for you or um you know maybe they're going through a lot of litigation and that's going to be taking time away from them so um you know that's definitely something that i think clients need to continue to be aware of and continue to kind of keep the keep the pulse on on their, their investments and the managers they're working with um so mike i want you know anything that you wanted to add to, to what neil just said well most of our clients uh you know I, well, to take a step back, I guess first, we don't provide any investment ideas to our clients. So, uh, you know, but I can just speak anecdotally about what I think what I think is happening. Um, you know, people tend to come to us with investment ideas and then we complete the due diligence on them from an operations perspective. Um, I would say that, you know, some clients are looking to fill a particular type of exposure and you know that that exposure could be interchangeable amongst managers. Um, and then that also could include some sort of risk return profile. And then in other instances, I think there's an interest in a, in a very specific manager that there may not be a good substitute for because something they're doing is quite unique. So those are the two ways that I would tend to think about the type of work that we do. Um, and uh, you know, I guess I would say that um, the operational due diligence uh, is important in that respect because in many cases, the investor may want to move forward with this, but haven't focused on the operation side. So by having an independent group look at the manager, um, where we actually have no, you know, we have no incentive whether the investment happens or not. And, you know, so so the, those are those are a good alignment of interests, I think, in the respect of using an independent operational due diligence firm. But that's typically how I think a lot of the people that we work with investments are selected along those sorts of parameters okay and, and james anything you wanted to add well just just very very quickly i would say given the current environment and the unusual circumstances that we're all in i find our clients are very much looking for managers to be re responsive and good at communicating how they're how they're managing their teams um, remotely how you know how compliance is continuing to provide good oversight of which is effectively instead of oversight of one office it's oversight of 50 offices if there are 50 employees right so i think we we need we really need to see managers being able to um, either provide questions and answers within their ddqs that that specifically address the issues around covid19 and that that really helps right. um, any the due diligence process so you, you kind of think there's going to be a whole another added layer of questions kind of related to what people have done and, and uh, to kind of accommodate since COVID-19. Yeah, I, I think I think so. I mean, we we ourselves have spent quite a lot of time and energy energy um, looking at what what has changed and how does that in, in, in change the operational risk, uh, risk dynamic. So, you know, business continuity plans, obviously, in cyber security was kind of certainly business continuity plans were just you know discussed in terms of in the event of a natural disaster you know in the event right. of something very unusual happened so is it it was a little bit of an academic exercise a little bit of sort of you know if you have a flood perhaps that might be an issue i mean and, and, and of course unfortunately terrorism and all those sorts of things but for the vast right. majority of managers it was just figurative 
but of course now we're living and right. breathing now, right so you you know the, it really does change the uh, the angle of attack if i can call it that in terms of the due diligence that's that's performed because the physical environment and the, the communications um and what was uh, what you could take for granted in terms of oversight from the compliance and the legal teams is to, it's just not there everything from you know being in the same canteen in the middle of the day and and compliance being able to walk the walk the floor and, and hear conversations and so on you know that just doesn't happen now so it's it's not it's by all means uh people are adapting incredibly fast and that's brilliant to see um but if uh if they if if they're saying for example well nothing's really changed and nothing's really we're working as we were before then then maybe you want to you know have a have a little look at that and see if that's really is the case yeah no and i think and i don't want to get on too much of a tangent here but i think um you know, part of it too is that you're not just talking about the security of, of the office anymore. I mean, before it was, you know, go in the office, everybody's there, you can see the desk space, you can see, you know, technology, all that. But now you're not talking about the technology of one office, you're talking about the technology of the office of every staff member right. and the security of every staff member's home because, you know, you know, some people like Neil are, are back in the office, but obviously not everybody is. And, and I suspect it's going to be quite some time. I mean, we could be talking at least, you know, another year before everybody um, has the potential to be back in the office. But even then, I'm not sure if that's going to be the case. You know, I think there's definitely going to be more of this working remotely. So then you have this whole other layer of security you have to worry about, I imagine. Yeah, and I think that with people naturally having laptops and sharing both their, their having their, you know, their private Yahoo email account on one side and their corporate email on the other, you know, there's yeah. a lot of connectivity going on now that would certainly raise the uh, raise the increase or likelihood that if they get a, a phishing email into their private email, uh, content area that it could transfer in, into the corporate world. I mean, in some respects, that could still happen in the office if you're not a good corporate citizen and you're, you know, or maybe the policies that are govern use of social media and so on. But the fact that people are on their own, you know, that they, that they don't have necessarily those reminders, they, they always say, right, in, in um, cybersecurity risk, it's the, it's the individuals, ourselves, that are potentially the biggest risk and you can have the best programs, the best oversight, but it comes down to individuals ensuring that they don't get, you know, fooled into into clicking clicking onto the wrong thing and, and providing answers, which allows uh, which right. allows an attack to take place. Yeah, no, yes, good 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 points there. Um, if we like, continue on with questions for a few more minutes here, but I just want to remind everybody: if you guys have any questions for the panelists, um, you know, generally speaking, or or specific to one person, go ahead and. Uh, Put them in the chat feature and we are monitoring that and we'll do a few more questions for them and then we'll go ahead and turn it over to the questions from you guys um so our next question for for you mike and then uh, i would like neil to respond to as well if, if he's interested in doing so um emerging managers you know evaluating them especially you know in an economy like that you know poses a challenge um you know, especially now what do you think are the most important things to be looking for in in the due diligence process um, I think a lot of the people that work with us find that that's, you know, an area we, where we can be particularly helpful, you know, is with respect to emerging managers. There's definitely a sense that there's a lot more risk at emerging managers than there are at well-established institutional managers. Um, there's two things I would say with emerging managers. The, the biggest point I would make is they tend to have smaller teams and there tend to be less segregation of duties internally. So you may have in a large organization, a different compliance officer, a different finance officer, a different controller, a uh, different person in operations, and those roles would be much more diffused. Whereas in a 10 or 12 person firm or smaller, those roles are gonna be consolidated within a single person typically. So there are less segregation of duties and potentially less controls you know, from a redundancy perspective. The second is a lot of emerging managers that are just getting started and with very good reason, often aren't using the most well-known and what some people may consider the best service providers in the industry across a lot of different potential services. Um, and not to say that for every manager, the most well-known is the best solution, but to save costs frequently, there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, incentive to use some of those less known service providers. So in many cases, 
the ODD person may have to do not only a significant amount of ODD on the manager and, and the lack of the segregation of duties and how they can make them improved, but also maybe on some of the service providers that if they've never met with them or understood their services before, will actually end up doing more work on those service providers than they would ordinarily do on, say, a much more well-established one. So those are the two points that I think are the most, you know, probably thoughtful points about doing ODD on emerging managers. Okay. Neil, I'd be interested to get your perspective as well. Hmm. I think Mark covered it nicely um, and touched on a few points that I was going to mention, but I'll add one or two other points. With, um, as Mark alluded to, you, have, you don't have too much of a track record to work with uh, when it comes to emerging managers. And you really have to dig deeper in the information that you do have. Um, obviously, this is another area where background checks make a lot of sense. Um, also, in, in, it, it does make sense to try and get um, an emerging managers, the individual's track records from their previous companies and previous experiences, although that's not always reflective of what they'll do in, in this new potentially right. uh, different role in a new company with a different strategy, but that might also be uh, quite effective. Um, what we often do is, is we're quite patient. Uh, we get to know the guys. We, we're not, uh, we're not, we don't rush to pull the trigger on those type of investments specifically. We also limit the allocation that we make to those type of investments, even though they you know, typically are um, higher return, higher risk, and, and, and we make our allocation process appropriately. And yeah, I think that sums it up. No, I think, and both of you guys touched on something, and, and Mike and I actually before the call had kind of discussed something else that, that I hadn't brought up yet, but I think kind of ties nicely into this, is, is talking about the emerging markets is, um, you know, a lot of it's the track record. Obviously, they don't maybe have, you know, a strong track record with where they currently are, but they have they have a history. Um, and one of the things that we'll do at Griffin is, um, which some more clients have definitely found beneficial, is not just do the, the public records research, but also do what we call human intelligence inquiries. Um, where, you know, reaching out to people that may have worked on it very discreetly, you know, we don't disclose who our client is, um, but, you know, ask some pretty pointed questions about their history and, uh, you know, their, their management styles and, you know, any, any accounting issues that have come up with them. You just go very deep and it can be very client specific and targeted as to what questions they're definitely looking to answer or, or what, where they're trying to gain some insight. Um, but that's definitely helped people, you know, not, um, particularly in, in countries where public records aren't so readily available. Um, you know, Latin America is a huge, you know, huge area where you may not be able to get a ton in the public records sec um, sector, but when it comes to human intelligence, you, you actually may be able to. So we've, we've built a network over the years of, of individuals around the world who can help us, you know, exactly with that. So, um, you know, definitely something to, to keep in mind, keep in mind as well. Um, so, so thank you all for the, that insight. Uh, we do have some questions that have come in, so I'd like to, you know, make sure that we do do address those. Um, so we'll go ahead and jump on the, into those now. Um, the first one is for all of you, so we'll let, we'll let James answer first. Um, with budget constraints in 2020 and beyond, uh, do you think you will struggle to justify the need to travel physically going forward? I think, I, you know, I, I believe the, the on-sites are a very important part of the due diligence process. Um, I think, though, that the as, you, as, as, the, as the questionnaire mentions there, that the cost of, of uh, travel is, is prohibitive. And, and I think you have to think about whether, um, from a health perspective as well, that it's something that you, that you want to do. I mean, we, we're, we're constantly reminded that, um, uh, that these the health issues at the moment is not something that's going to go away anytime soon. So it's bound to significantly impact uh, the, the travel. I mean, we, we ourselves are constantly speaking to uh, other groups, other operational due diligence groups around the world um, we, in, in a way to, um, to have strategic relationships, right? So that, for example, if there was a, a manager in, in Asia or a manager in, in the US and we're based in, in London and we cannot travel, then we're looking at ways that we can we can have that, those relationships with 
groups that are on site and and on the ground and, and vice versa so we're here, we're here based in london uh allocators asset owners can't get to travel or don't wish to travel we have this in the uk as you probably know a two-week quarantine that's in place and although that's not expected to last too long i i think with the political pressures that i've been hearing today i think they'll though there'll be continuing travel restrictions and so again like in all of this we need to ensure that we adapt and, and think about how best we can deliver full due diligence services to, to our clients. Fair enough. Uh, Neil, do you have some feedback? Neil? Sorry, I didn't manage to hear you. Um, from, from our perspective, it's obviously crucial to look our managers and our investment companies in the eye. Uh, we're fortunate that we have a New York office um, that we can delegate some of those responsibilities to and ask them to go and meet with the guys and you know inspect their uh, company's headquarters and ha have a meeting face to face in addition to all the work that we're doing over here. Um, but it is definitely a challenge that we're going to have to work with. And it's although the video conference calls have been highly effective. I think it's very hard to get a sense for a new manager, um, you know, without looking them literally in the eye. Right. right. Mike, how about you? Um, I'd say that our that that ranges widely by client. So I'd say prior to say March, we had almost always gone on site for all of our clients. Um, going forward, I think uh, some were probably more uncomfortable at the beginning and more comfortable now. Some were never uncomfortable. Um, I'd say it has a lot to do with their perceived risk of the manager, the strategy that they're in, how institutional that manager is. It also has to do, quite honestly, with how often our client has been on site with that manager. Mm -hmm. So have they never been on site with that manager and we would be the only people on site? That would be extremely rare. but that type of situation or you know maybe the client only visited an office that wasn't the main office and we were hoping they were hoping that Shadmore would visit the main office so there's it's it's honestly it's a lot of different um you know things like that that are taken into consideration okay. um but i do think generally though most of the time and in most cases uh people have generally becoming more and more comfortable with doing these virtual on sites but they are not a perfect substitute but they're probably a sufficient substitute in most cases. Okay, or, or at least for, for the short term, it sounds like. Definitely for the short um, term, yeah. Yeah, okay. Neil, the next question is for you. Uh, in general, given the volatile markets around the world, have you seen more attractive investment opportunities? Yeah, so we've definitely seen some very interesting opportunities. We believe that the next few months and quarters will present even more opportunities. Um, although I can't share specific investment advice, um, I can think of one or two dislocation opportunities that we have identified that I can share with you. Uh, so I'll, I'll give I'll, I'll give those examples. So the one is we run um, an internally managed private debt fund of funds, uh, and it focuses mainly on real estate backed lending and we've identified that real estate developers who typically would have otherwise um, turned to their banking relationship for a certain loan uh, are now more and more turning to real estate private debt funds and that's because the banks are simply inundated with uh, for forbearance requests and uh, late repayments and other things that they have to sort out right now. So they're very slow. Banks are very slow to act on new opportunities. What that means is that those real estate developers, uh, in order not to lose out on new opportunities that they are seeing in turn in, in, in their markets, they're willing to pay a little bit more in terms of the interest rates on those loans. Um, and they're willing to give even greater security um, so we're in a more secured position and sometimes have an even higher than usual interest rate, which is obviously a very attractive opportunity. Um, and the security, I should mention, is in the form of a first legal right. 
uh, over the property that the real estate developer is interested in. Another short um, example that I can think of um, is in, in the corporate bond space. There's another dislocation opportunity over there, or potential dislocation opportunity, I should say. Um, currently, corporate bonds are reflecting in their pricing severe uh, and ex potentially even excessive default rates. Um, and in, in, in that's in relation to historical data, even during crises. And, and one could take a view on, on, on whether those default rates are too conservative or not. But, you know, we, we see that as an interesting area to look at as well. Okay. Thank you for that. Thank the next that. question is going to be for Mike and James. Um, James, we'll start with, with you first. Does ODD change for investments in different regions of the around the world, or is it a pretty standard approach? Well, ODD definitely varies significantly between strategy, strategy and strategy. Um, it can differ between jurisdiction, jurisdiction, but I'd say less so. I mean, my experience is, is performing due diligence both in Europe, US, US and Asia. All jurisdictions are at different um, speeds, I guess, in, in certain aspects, whether that may be fund governance was certainly ahead in Europe versus the US and, and Asia. Um, compliance and personal account trading uh, was was certainly different in, in Asia when I first started doing operational due diligence. Um, when, uh, you know, um, when non uh, material, non-public information was was wasn't quite as a theme or a topic as it, as it is now so that very much difference but but the key obvious one that sticks out for me that that's very different is private markets operational due diligence with with hedge fund operational due diligence almost you know almost distinct certainly when it comes to reviewing the fund because of the fund structure um the uh the way that the uh, vehicle is constructed and and used to, to, to deliver returns um, and what it can also do during the period of time for which you are invested in the in that period is is very is significantly different from what can be what is uh, what is the sort of normal opera, um, modus operandi within within hedge funds. So yeah, I mean I I I have uh, you know a, a, in excess of twenty five different types of templates depending on manager size, um, strategy, um, all that come from a, an ODD um, questionnaire bank and designing questions, designing questionnaires so that they can be as relevant um, to the particular manager and the particular strategy that you're, that you're looking to get at. And to be honest, unless you do that, it can be very frustrating and indeed potentially damaging to be asking the wrong questions, getting the wrong answers, uh, not clearly understanding how operations uh, mesh with investments and what the dependencies are and how the ecosystem works with service providers. All of that, all of that's very, very important in order to to enable you to to ensure that you come out with a good and uh, informative uh, um, operational due diligence assessment. Okay. And Mike, how about you? Yeah, there's there's no question that there's I mean there's different ODD approaches that need to be taken for different investment strategies. When you you know some questions just are not nearly as rough for some strategies as they are for others. And then furthermore, I think at this point you certainly don't want to be going down a road where you look as if you're not well educated about those differences, um, or that you appear to be very inexperienced. But second, I'd say. The regulatory environment is very different in the US versus Europe versus Asia. And that also gets compounded even further when you have managers that are in multiple jurisdictions as opposed to just one of them. So trying to get a handle on, you know, what type of registrations, what type of regulatory environment are they in, 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 a, in a specific environment can be quite complicated. Um, you know, obviously experience helps you with that. Sometimes, you you know, some of the discussions we've had with compliance consultants can help with that. And obviously conferences and things like that. But I particularly would say the regulatory environment in these different jurisdictions adds the most complications to looking at managers globally. 
No, thank you. That's definitely definitely valuable. Um, so we actually have another question for for Mike and James. Um, Mike, we'll let you start with this one. How do you ensure that policies and procedures are being followed when a manager's staff is working from home? Um, any concerns about the manager's documentation of activities or actions when the staff is not in the office? Yeah, I mean, this is a big question. People are wondering about, um, you know, you have people working from home now and they're potentially dealing with material non-public information about deals and investments and things like that. And they may not be, they may be living with people who are not on the personal trading policy of the firm that they're working for. Because if it's not, not a spouse, necessarily someone who's a part of their household. And then obviously that dovetails with all the IT security questions that we talked about earlier, where someone's working extensively right. from home, where that was, that was probably not happening as often before. Um, I think what I would say is that um, just overall with ODD, we're trying to do testing, you know, so the biggest danger in ODD, in my opinion, is to take the information that were received and just sort of regurgitate that back to our clients. I think testing has got to be a big part of that throughout the ODD process. Um, in this specific instance, I think we're trying to understand what controls are in place. We knew a lot of that before at, on the home front. Um, this question has come up a lot. I don't know that it's, I don't know that it's sort of moving to the forefront of the biggest concern right now. Um, people are still having to submit to their internal policy, submit brokerage statements, probably in many cases pre-clear trades, um, and obviously have all controls around how they access their uh, network from home, probably using something like Citrix or VPN. So I feel as if the control environment is good. But I think to James's point, which was you know a few minutes earlier stated, part of the ODD process now certainly is asking about how that's going, how is that monitoring going, what's changed. Um, but for me, I'm less worried about that than I still am about the other big topic items, if you will. Okay, James, anything that you want to add there? Yeah, I mean, I I, I would uh, I would add just to sort of add that. Um, you know, just because somebody's working at home doesn't mean they're still part of the same uh, governance um, and oversight, certainly from a, an IT perspective and certainly from a reporting perspective, as, as Mike just mentioned. Um, you know, an individual who sits in the office on their own laptop is, is still at risk of not following the operating procedures, just as they would be if they're at home i think it's much more accentuated because there's a everyone's literally distributed everywhere and i think that's that's what makes people feel uncomfortable but you know i do believe that you know good practices good oversight good management good communications should mean that that collective cohesiveness around the operations um, should be able to continue and the second point i'd mention is that we've now been down sort of in lockdown for a good part of 10 weeks, I think it is now. We've gone through a quarter, 31st of March. Um, so we should be able to see evidence of, of monitoring, compliance monitoring, evidence of compliance training uh, remotely if necessary, uh, evidence even of in terms of cyber security, you know, a lot of the uh, the vendor shops that oversee cyber security within, within managers are able to provide and will provide monthly or quarterly uh, attack reports and um, and uh, performance of staff in terms of number of uh, clicks right on um, spurious emails and so on. So right. I think you can to, to Mike's point absolutely it's about the testing it's about the verif verifying and to be honest that that was the case before COVID-19 and it remains the case now. You've still got to get to that same point. Um, you've, uh, as we've said before, you've, you've just got to, you know, you've just got to focus in on a few extra elements of that right. to, to the okay. same operational conviction. No, no, good, good, good insight there as well. So we do have one more question and I know we're running short on time. So Neil, I'll direct this one to you and, and See if, uh, see if you can give a you know short short answer to this question. Uh, historically, what sort of reputation or uh, reputational or excuse me reputation or operational risks were detect detected in due diligence that were strong enough to consider avoiding or unwinding a relationship or investment of one of your clients? So I'll say that um, from a reputational point of view. Um, 
I'll answer that question in a different way. When when we f feel uncomfortable, uh, even if all the boxes seem to be met, uh, seem to be ticked from our process point of view, um, and from a performance point of view, the manager is still performing. If our gut feeling is not good with that specific investment manager, we will not remain in the investment. Uh, and we have acted like that in the past. Uh, and it's benefited us, us and it saved us good money. Um, and, and, and there have been cases where those managers were then subsequently, um, you know, our fears about them have actually come through. Um, in other cases where managers um, cease to communicate effectively, or um, refuse to give us access, um, you know, to perform a background check um, on them. That is also a serious cause for concern, and that, that would also lead us to, for example, exit the investment. Um, so I hope that's uh, valuable insights. Yeah, no, no, yeah. Great, great insight for sure. And um, so, you know, we've talked a lot today about a number of different factors that go into manager selection, overall due diligence process, you know on sites versus what we can do remotely. Um, so I want to ask one, one final question to kind of wrap it up uh, with all of you. Um, Mike, we'll have you answer first. In your opinion, what are the human elements of the due diligence process, that technology one way or another, and, and you know, I'm going to kind of throw in, there's a lot of talk out there about you know, the use of AI and that sort of thing. But in, in general, what's, part that, what's something that the human elements um, are, technology will never replace? I, w I would say that with ODD, the, the danger in, the, in this context is where you've got a lot of questions, you've answered those questions, but you haven't necessarily analyzed those questions. So the answers to those questions is more specifically. So, you know, you, you know that you, you want to ask these hundred things. Now you have the answers, but you really need to sit down and actually think, wait, do these answers make sense in the context of this investment? So I know that this manager has a lot of level three assets, but on this other question, I know that their liquidity is monthly 30. So I've answered all the questions, but that's not sufficient, right? You have to ana analyze whether the context and the totality of all these things make sense. That's where I think some things get lost. So I don't know that any sort of artificial intelligence is going to be able to take the role of that in the near term, maybe very, very long term. but the danger that we see sometimes is you 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 feel like, okay, mission accomplished, we've gotten all the answers, we've checked the boxes on everything that we wanted to ask, but we now need to actually take that extra step to say, does the totality of all of these make sense based on what our knowledge of this mm -hmm. investment is looking like? Subtle, but I think that's a really important thing for everyone to think about. Okay, James, how about you? I, yeah, I mean, I agree with those points that Mike has made. Um, you know, ODD is uh, is both an art and a science, right? Sort of, sort of really talking about what Mike was referring to there. Um, there is the science element to it, though, that I, I as I sort of alluded to earlier, that um, you know, I think that a lot of technology can be used very much in a way to ensure that the due diligence process is efficient. Um, and cutting out some of the uh, manual checks and, and balances that need to be that need to be eyeballed when actually technology could could do that for you. Um, I think specifically fund financial statement re reviews are incredibly difficult to automate with certainty. Um, and then sort of just just lastly, just to flip it on its head a little bit, um, you know, when when going on site, remember as as human beings, we're all open to influence. So you know, if your documents tell you one thing and the manager tries to convince you of something else, like for mm. example, you know, so, scope of cyber security coverage by a vendor and the vendor tells you one thing, head of IT tells you another, you, you may want to go with the vendor story. So um, I think the art and science of it is, is really always going to be there. But personally, I'd like to see technology removing a lot of some of the more manual processes that it comes to that, that is used in the operational due diligence okay. process, the gathering of documents, compiling, aggregating data, all that sort right. of thing, and actually really enhance the art of, of ODD. 
Okay. And, and Neil, we're, we're definitely short on time. I want to give you, you an opportunity to add in anything else too. So I agree with what James and Mark have said. Uh, I would add that we make use of a lot of technological tools and screening methods, um, which are very valuable. But as I said in my previous answer, um, numbers just don't tell the whole story. Um, you know, you need to get comfortable. You need to have a good gut feel about things, even when everything else uh, from numbers point of view makes, you know, makes sense. Computers can read numbers. They, they don't have a gut feeling. Um, computers also can't sense um, whether a manager is guarding from arrogance or not. Um, it's something that is very important, especially when a manager's performed well over a couple of years and suddenly we sense that they're dropping the ball and that the quality is just not the same and that they're taking bolder, uh, they're making bolder moves and taking on, on undue risks. That's something that would take, you know, technology a, a little bit longer uh, and it's a little bit to, to pick up on and it's a little bit more nuanced. So that that's where I think that uh, the human interaction comes in. Okay. Thank you, Neil, so much. And, and unfortunately with that, our time is up. Uh, we'd like to thank you all for taking the time to join us today. Um, I'd also like to give a special thanks to our panelists, James, Mike, and Neil, for their time and contributions to the discussion. Uh, shortly, all attendees of this webinar will receive an email from Griffin with a link to the recorded version of today's discussion, as well as the email addresses for each of our panelists. Please don't hesitate to reach out to James, Mike, or Neil, or myself with any follow-up questions regarding the topics discussed today.